Welcome to Hamburgers and Horror, the home of meat, monsters, and metal. I'm Noah Hook, and today we're looking at Deathgasm. This 2015 horror comedy from New Zealand follows a teenage metalhead whose band unwittingly summons an ancient evil called the Blind One. The unlikely group is forced to work together to stop the demon and his vicious cult of followers. Deathgasm was written and directed by Jason Lee Howden, who has also directed Guns Akimbo, as well as making visual effects for films like The Hobbit Trilogy, Man of Steel, and Shang-Chi. Howden took inspiration from his own youth, in which he was a social outcast and heavy metal enthusiast. The film stars Milo Cawthorn from Power Rangers RPM, Blood Punch, and Pork Pie, James Blake from Top of the Lake and The Hobbit, and Kimberly Crossman from A Beginner's Guide to Snuff, The 60 Yard Line, and Megan. Cinematography was handled by Simon Raby, who has also shot films like The Girl on the Bridge, No Exit, and Megan. The score was collaborated on by Chris Vandegeer of Black Sheep, and Joost Langeveld of Being Eve and it features a ton of metal bands like Skullfist, Beast Wars, and Bullet Belt to name a few. Deathgasm was primarily funded through the Make My Horror Movie contest in which Howden received $200,000. It received pretty positive reviews from critics upon release, with people enjoying its high energy, lowbrow comedy, and grindhouse levels of gore. Deathgasm currently has an 88 and 66% on Rotten Tomatoes, so while a bit varied, it seems to be enjoyed by general audiences as well. Big thank you to my patron Uncle Pete for requesting Deathgasm for me to review. I have watched it once, but it was in the middle of a party, so while I remember enjoying it, the details are all a bit hazy. You should put away your church stuff for this one, folks, because we're watching Deathgasm. The movie opens with a grainy black and white intro delivered by Brody, who warns us that all the scary evil shit in metal music is actually real. We get a very Metalocalypse style intro before Brody takes us back to where the story began. He has just moved to a small town named Greypoint after his mom went on a festive bender that left her in psychiatric care, and he now lives with his uncle Albert. Their eat, pray, love aesthetic doesn't quite vibe with Brody's. At school, we meet the various characters of this story, starting with Brody's asshole cousin David. He hates Brody and can't wait for his dad to kick him out into the streets. He's also bullying a guy named Dion, a nerdy fella who likes tabletop games. Here he also spots Medina, this movie's love interest, and of course, David's girlfriend. Dion says she'd never go for a metalhead, but he does invite Brody to play games with him and his buddy named Giles. Brody ascends from the Middle Earth nerdery with his headphones, transporting him to a He-Man mountaintop with bountiful guitar solos and gratuitous boob shots. That is before David gives the boys a golden shower. Damn, Brody even gets shit on by the teachers in class, but Medina feels sorry for him and even grows tired of David's obsession with bullying. The one place Brody feels at home is Alien Records, where the owner Byron shows him a limited edition record signed by the fictional artist Ricky Daggers. In the metal section, he bonds with a fella named Zack, who quickly becomes his chaotic weed-smoking, blood-packed-making, napalm-cooking best friend. He also plays bass, so naturally the four outcasts start a band. The boys throw out a variety of childish names to call themselves before Zack gives the band and the movie a title. Now Zack is bringing Brody as a lookout during a literal home invasion, I guess. Brody's a nervous Nelly and follows him inside, where some newspaper clippings reveal this to be the hideout of Ricky Daggers. Zack says the metal artist blew his money on sex, drugs, and Satanist stuff, so I guess they're here to rob one of their idols? Ricky is there and seemingly dead until Zack tries to take the Hacks and Sword record in his hands, at which point the metalhead springs to life. He attacks the boys with a bat and retrieves the record, asking them if they've been sent by Aeon and his cult. The boys share that they are simply fans, and apparently Ricky's location was doxxed in a magazine or something. 
This guy straight out of an Argento film rolls up with a straight razor, and Ricky tells the boys to hide this record and protect it with their lives. The assassin named Vaden enters as the boys flee, and when Ricky refuses to cooperate, he gives the artist a vicious throat slash that I cannot show you on YouTube. Brody and Zack return home to find that Ricky duped them with a Rick Astley record, but inside the sleeve is some very old sheet music with a title written in Latin. Gee, I wonder if something bad will happen when they play the music. Vaden returns to the headquarters of evil guy Aeon, informing him that the Black Hymn has been taken. Aeon is displeased and punishes his minion's failure by immediately having him beheaded. Oh come on, that's a custom made Satori rug, idiots! You put a tarp down first. AGAIN! DO IT! AGAIN! He makes the masked fuckers put down a tarp and replicate the kill, and we also meet his assistant Shayna, who pops out from under Aeon's desk. She'll be surprisingly important later. Deathgasm is filming their first music video out in the woods, looking like a cross between Kiss and Motionless and White. At a gas station, Brody bumps into Medina, and she invites him to join her for an ice cream. Turns out she rescued a drawing of his that a teacher threw away, and she asks if he would design a tattoo for her. You know, I was thinking about getting it just, um, just here. Yes. Good spot for it? She asks about his interest in metal, and Brody gives a very angsty but heartfelt explanation of his love for it. He awkwardly fumbles his way out of a kiss by lending her some gorgeous CDs, and it's revealed the two are being watched by grumpy ass David. Deathgasm assembles to try their hand at the black hymn, and the song causes them to enter a trance, the lights to flash, a portal to start opening, and Uncle Albert to turn into a deadite. Brody comes to and stops before they finish playing, so catastrophe is avoided for now. Meanwhile, Medina throws one of Brody's CDs into her fucking Discman, which sends her into a hair metal video of her own. In school, Brody manages to translate the Latin written above the song, and it doesn't look too good. After school, he's jumped by David and his lackey Terry, who rip out his earring and kick the shit out of him. Medina finds Zack stealing gas from an ambulance because why the fuck not, and for some reason she decides he'd be a trustworthy option to deliver a note to Brody. As expected, Zack does not deliver the note, and she simply believes him when he says Brody isn't interested in dating her. Medina and Zack end up making out, and to make matters even worse, Brody returns home to find his room trashed. Consumed by rage, Brody resolves to play the Black Hymn in order to take revenge on his bullies. At the next band practice, they successfully complete the Black Hymn, during which the garage doors open to infiltrate the ears of Uncle Albert, this guy, this baby, and every other person in a three block radius. The boys awaken on the floor with searing headaches, and Brody believes the song failed since he isn't imbued with demonic power. The next day at school, Brody is approached by Terry at the urinal, who is looking a bit worse for wear. He warns him the blind one is on his way, and is planning to roast his nuts over an open fire. Ah shit, Mr. Cappenhurst is possessed too, and the teacher shits blood before Sam Raimi borrows the camera for a zoom in. This poor girl gets absolutely drenched in blood again and again and again. That night, Brody tells Zack that Medina blew him off today, but Zack keeps why that happened to himself. He's also noticed his whole neighborhood is acting strange, including Zack's headbanging dad. Ah shit, and he's ripped his own eyes out, hell yeah! He attacks Zack until Brody comes at him with a grinder and shaves his face right off. Zack finishes his demonic dad by dropping a whole ass engine on his head. Zack shows emotion for half a second before sending his father off with a metal salute. Brody confesses the truth about the Black Hymn, and they decide to visit Byron's palm-reading wife Abigail for advice. On the way, they notice the neighborhood is going full Dawn of the Dead. 
Meanwhile, Dion and Giles have made their way to Brody's looking for help, as their paintballs and dice aren't enough to take the demons down. Good thing Medina shows up with some mean firefighter skills. They leave a note for Brody and Zack before heading to the school to hunker down. The boys find Abigail mangled but still alive, and she informs them that Aeloth, king of the demons, has been summoned due to their playing of the Black Hymn. Aeloth's minions are possessing and killing all in their path in preparation for his arrival, which will be at 3am tonight. Aeloth will possess the darkest soul he can find, and just before Abigail can share how to stop him, she receives an arm through the chest from her own possessed husband. Aeon and his posse are greeted by Demon Terry, who tells them they must destroy the Black Hymn in order to prevent Deathgasm from using it to prevent Aeloth's ascension. Only those with souls can touch the pages, so it must be done with human hands. The demon also shares that Aeloth will attach to the darkest soul he can find, at which point Shayna shanks Aeon in the back and right down the throat. Damn, in front of your whole posse, that's embarrassing. She pledges allegiance to Aeloth, and Terry tells her to destroy the pages to receive unimaginable power. He also tells her Brody is the key to finding the hem. Even without Abigail's help, Brody figures the only way to reverse the spell is to play the Black Hymn in reverse, and after a brief spat, Zack reluctantly agrees to help him. They arrive at Brody's, and for some reason, Zack hides Dion's note from him. The boys are attacked by Albert and Mary, fleeing to a nearby bedroom. The only weapons they can find are hidden away in a box labeled church stuff, and it's filled with what most would agree is not very churchy. The boys arm themselves with anal beads and dildos to take on the demons, but when they prove ineffective, Brody flees to the garage. He returns with a chainsaw but trips, and Zack is dragged away by Albert. The horny uncle gets the upper hand, but Zack manages to grab a big veiny boy and bash his face until his fucking jaw falls off. Mary has pinned Brody down over the chainsaw, but Zack returns to whack her with the beads. Brody grabs the saw and rams it through her, but even a full disembowelment isn't enough to stop her. Brody ultimately finishes Mary by jamming two vibrators right into her ears. The scene is capped off with David entering the home, and Brody immediately chainsawing him in the face. Pretty sure he wasn't possessed. What? Oh no, of course he was. When he came in, he said uh, something about Satan. Then the fucking pages just blow away into the night, I guess, so the journey continues. An Edgar Wright style montage has the boys upgrade their weapons, notably adding a weed whacker to their arsenal. They eliminate several demons while collecting the pages, including a pantsless fella that gets his whipper snipped. The journey obviously takes them to the school for plot purposes, and despite Zack's argument, Brody heads inside and locates the homies. While getting a wound bandaged, Brody notices Zack's jacket in Medina's bag, and the two piece together that he lied to them about the note. Brody confronts Zack and his very poor reasoning, I'm not even into it, I was just bored. And the two engage in some typical mosh pit shenanigans. Zack ends up beating the crap out of Brody, professing that he never liked him before leaving. The rest of the group begins planning to play the hymn backwards, with Brody deciding to move the operation to Ricky Dagger's hideout so they can use his amps. They seemingly get there without issue, but the second they enter, they're surrounded by Shayna and her followers. Brody trades the black hymn for Medina's life, and Shayna promptly rips it to shreds. They tie the kids up in a bedroom as a live sacrifice to Aeloth, and the cult begins calling out to their god. Brody apologizes for causing all of this, and turns out demonic Ricky Daggers was stuffed into a chest for some reason. He decides to skullfuck Dion, fair enough, but luckily Zack returns and annihilates his favorite artist with a claw hammer. He unties his bandmates and makes up with Brody bro style, but Medina has questions. You decided that you wanted to help us and then you went and applied makeup? They plan to get Brody to his guitar and he will try his best to play the hymn backwards while they protect him. 
Zack bursts into the summoning and shoves a chainsaw up a cultist's ass, but before he can finish the other, he is pulled outside by some hungry, hungry demons. Medina and Giles surround Brody, and somehow Dion got lost in this tiny fucking house. The sweet nerd isn't as formidable as his D&D characters and gets his whole head torn from his body predator style. Giles suffers a similar fate, this time getting his arms ripped off and beaten to death with them. Brody took some inspiration from Russ Thorne and added a drill to his guitar, Zack is going full Chainsaw Man, and Medina is going full Jack Torrance. They manage to take down the demons as the clock hits 3, and Aeoloth's big beam of light casts down onto them. Shanna removes her top to invite him inside, but just as the demon begins to enter, Zack stabs her with a big ass sword. Unfortunately, this doesn't defeat Aeloth, he simply switches plans and enters Zack's body. Dark Zack teleports behind Brody and starts knocking both of them around, but Brody uses a trick Zack taught him to give the demon an uppercut. Aeloth responds by goring Brody in the gut with his big ass horn. He turns his attention to Medina as Brody picks up his guitar, and he just starts shredding away. Brody may not know the black hymn by heart, but he's able to shred hard enough to reach Zack's metal heart. He momentarily takes back control from Aeloth, but he tells Brody he has to finish him to send the demon back to hell. Brody removes his blood-packed razor and slices open Zack's throat, killing his somewhat shitty friend and the King of Demons. He gives his fallen brother a salute before we jump ahead two full months later, and I guess Medina is a full-blown metalhead now. She's even got a sick new tattoo designed by Brody. The movie ends with Brody suddenly getting a message from Aeloth through his record player. And that's Deathgasm. This was a lot of fun, it just has so much energy. This movie so evidently loves films like The Evil Dead and Bad Taste, and it manages to revel in violence and gore without ever feeling mean-spirited. There were a few iffy digital effects here and there, but generally all of the practical effects were a ton of fun. Y'all know I'm pretty picky when it comes to horror comedies, but I'd say about 75% of the jokes landed for me here, which is higher than usual. And its types of comedy range from gross-out slapstick, to sarcasm, to puns, to really subtle black comedy, so there's a bit of everything for everyone mixed in here. The various possessed characters add a lot of scares and laughs, and the removed eyeballs were a nice touch. I will say that Aeloth's final form is a little disappointing, the face is clearly just a huge hunk of rubber that provided James Blake with very little facial movement or emotion. And as with a lot of low budget horror movies that promise a really powerful final boss, Aeloth's powers are extremely vague at best and he accomplishes very little during his 5 minutes of screen time. And I feel like the story gets a little bogged down by the love triangle component. I know it makes sense in a high school setting kind of story, but I just feel like it could have been replaced by more gore, more action, or just something more unique. And with the film primarily following a group of high school boys, you can expect a fair amount of immaturity, especially when it comes to Zack. There were times where the super stylish editing felt a bit out of sync with the metal vibes of the film, especially in the first 20 minutes, but generally it's really refreshing to see a film with so much style and flair. It really is an impressive film, especially considering the low budget they were working with. All in all, Deathgasm is a funny, gruesome, super metal splatter fest. It's a great spiritual successor to films like Trick or Treat and Black Roses while adding a lot more gore into the mix. It has dynamic editing, a badass score, campy villains, and enough blood to make Art the Clown blush. The plot is a bit familiar and the comedy will probably have various mileage with different people, but it has more than enough fun to make it worth a watch. Thank you again to my patron Uncle Pete for requesting it for me to review. Deathgasm has definitely gone up in my list of favorite metal and punk horrors like The Devil's Candy and The Green Room. 
And if y'all have any recommendations for other movies like this involving heavy metal, rock, punk, anything like that, definitely throw them down in the comments. Well, that's about it. Join me in two weeks as we check out Friday the 13th Part 3. As always, I'm Noah Hook, and thanks for watching Hamburgers and Horror. Stay safe out there. Thanks for watching my review of Deathgasm. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and subscribe so you can keep up with all my horror reviews. And if you want to help support the channel further, you should check out my Patreon account. You'll be able to vote for future movies and franchises I cover on the channel. Thanks, y'all.